anyways, well, welcome everyone on a Saturday morning. Um, I'm sure uh, we all had a fun Friday night, or some of you had. Uh, some of us had to work, but anyways, hope you guys are doing well, and we're going to just get started um, with a short video, and then we will get started. Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. We are Pre-Med CC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online community for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students, people that lack the financial resources, or just those that do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. PST, and on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. PST. If you aren't able to attend the event, all our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end with Q&A with our speakers. Any questions that you have can be put in the Q&A section on Zoom and our team members will read them and have them answered. After you have attended our event, you can log on to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you'll be awarded a two-hour mentorship certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with our upcoming events or want to tell your pre-med friends about pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at pre-med CC. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Today, I have with me Dr. Wagner and I have um, Mr. Davis today. All right. And I will be introducing them. Dr. Grad, uh, Wagner graduated in osteopathic medical school at Des Moines University in 1983 and received lifetime board certification from the AOBFP in 1991. She went on to earn the fellow award from the ACOFP in, the, in 2002 and the distinguished fellow award from the ACOFP conclave of fellows in 2015. She currently serves as the assistant dean of Academic Affairs, Associate Professor of Primary Care and Chair of the Curriculum and Admissions Committee. Dr. Wagner has practiced as an osteopathic family physician in her own practice, as well as an employed physician. From 1999 to 2003, she was the Director of Medical Education and Program Director for the Family Medicine Residency at Lake Mead Hospital. She then spent nine years working in occupational medicine as a regional medical director for U.S. Health, Health Works, where she had oversight for 35 occupational medicine clinics in Southern California. In 2013, Dr. Wagner joined the faculty at Tucson full-time. Initially, she was an assistant professor and clinic physician lead at Family Health Services Clinics at TUC. In 2016, she was promoted to associate professor and co-course co coordinator at the four-semester osteopathic doctorate courses. In 2017, she was asked to serve as vice, vice chair of the primary care department. Since arriving at TUCOM, Dr. Wagner received the Douglas Ward PhD Educator of the Year Award for the American Osteopathic Foundation in 2016, Master Preceptor Award from the ACOFP in 2017, and the Physician of the Year Award from OPSC in 2018. She is a Costin Scholar, completing the one-year course in 2015. In 2020, Dr. Wagner completed a one-year-long course and received a Certificate of Completion in Effective Instruction from the Associate of College and University Educators for in-person teaching and completed the online teaching course in 2022. In 2021, she was recognized as an item writer of the year for Complex Level 3, CDM by the N NBOM by for 2020. All right, and now to introduce Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis has filled several positions within the world of gra graduate and professional school admissions for nearly 25 years, and he is currently the Director of Admissions at Turo University, California, a position he's held for more than 10 years. 
Mr. Davis has a bachelor's degree from California State University, East Bay, and a master's degree from Turo University World Worldwide. In his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his family and reading various books in the fiction, science fiction, and fantasy genres. Welcome to both of you. Hello. Um, excuse my... Uh... My video today, I'm zooming in from another college campus. I just got done with a, with a presentation. Uh, Dr. Wagner, I saw your comment. I do not have that. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation this morning. I, I hope Dr. Wagner has one. Uh, she and I weren't able to connect on, on Friday. Uh, what I'd like to do though, I think it would be helpful um, is to possibly, uh, Dr. Wagner, if you agree, you wanna lead off with, uh, with your presentation and I'll, uh, I'll come in afterwards talking about admissions or do you want to do it the other way around? I do have a PowerPoint and I'm going to use that, but I want to actually start with something that Jubin shared with me a few moments before the this session started. And he said that there are still um, some of you out there who aren't really sure what an osteopathic physician is or what they do. So I want to take a moment and tell you about that. There are two fully licensed physicians in the United States of America. They can do anything from surgery to deliver babies to family medicine, to internal medicine, to work in hospitals. They can do anything. And those two physicians are osteopathic physicians and allopathic physicians. Allopathic are known as MDs. Osteopathic are known as DO. And so we get the all of the science training and we get an additional 200 hours of focused education on osteopathic principles and practice. The osteopathic physician, um, osteopathic medicine was started in the late 1800s by Andrew Taylor, still MDDO, who was dissatisfied with the practice of medicine at the time. He had just lost multiple family members to um, encephalitis, uh, which is a brain infection. And he felt there had to be a better way. He was extremely inclusive way before his time. He accepted women into his medical school. He accepted people of color into his medical school. So he was very, very much inclusive uh, long before it was a popular consideration. And he was down in Missouri doing that. He was in an area called Kirksville, Missouri. We've now grown to be 40 plus osteopathic medical schools at over 60 plus campuses and growing. Um, we match every specialty and there are DOs in every specialty. We are, however, known for our osteopathic tenants, our osteopathic approach to patients, and the fact that more osteopathic physicians on a per capita, so presented, percent of osteopathic graduates to total osteopathic physicians versus percent of allopathic graduates to their total, we tend to have more physicians who want to go into primary care and serve their community and fewer physicians who go into a full research type job. That does not mean DOs don't do research. They do, but that is sort of the focus. And if you get online, go online and read the mission of Toro University, California College of Osteopathic Medicine, you will see caring, competent osteopathic physicians who focus on primary care service to the community and social justice. So that is our mission as well. So I hope that sort of settles any of those of you who had a doubt as to what osteopathic physicians can do. Um, we can do everything and I have done just about everything. Um, so that's that's where I wanted to sort of start. I'm gonna show you some, some slides that we use. We actually use some of this uh, when we're talking about our admissions interviews. And I think this will help you understand a little bit about our school. Um, and then if there's time after Mr. Davis speaks, I'm happy to talk on some do's and don'ts for your applications, some questions about how do you get access to different people or different things. Um, and Mr. Davis, I hope you might have the link for the Shadow program for these folks as well. So let me do a screen share. There you go. And apologize that Mr. Davis and I did not get to catch up with each other. As you can imagine, sometimes the week just gets away with you. Uh, okay, wait a second. I'm down there so I can get my slideshow. There we go. 
All right. Um, this is our class of 2025. Uh, just as the slide says, taken in front of our one of our main lecture areas called Lander Hall. And I say it's our main lecture area because today it is. But by July 24th, 2024, we will be expanding our class size and our main lecture area will be a combination of Lander Hall, which you're seeing the students in front of, and an area called Truett Hall. Um, again, I mentioned our mission and here it is. We uphold the values and practice of osteopathic medicine who are committed to primary care and the holistic approach to the patient. Um, and if you are looking at things about osteopathic medicine, look, Google the four tenets of osteopathic medicine, and it will really give you a sense of where osteopathic physicians come from. The program advances their profession and serves its students and society through innovative pre-doctoral and postdoctoral education, research, community service, and multidisciplinary and osteopathic clinical services. And that really, we live our mission at, in California. Um, we have a College of Osteopathic Medicine on our campus, a Master's of Medical of Medical Health Sciences. We have a College of Pharmacy, a Master of Science and Physician Assistant Studies, a Master's of Public Health, a Master of Science in Nursing, and a Family Nurse Practitioner Certificate. And that is growing. Um, and we do have a way for students who enter our osteopathic medicine program to earn a dual degree of DOMPH without adding any extra time. And we also have a doctor of education. Uh, we've been in, U in US News and World Report for the last 11 years uh, in a row, ranked in the top 15 nationally for matching primary care residencies. Mr. Davis, will you watch the chat? And if there's something I need to answer, holler out for me. It's hard to, to watch both. Our class of 2021, had 100% pass rate on our boards, the Comlex, and better than 99% at USMLE. But I want to be real clear, we are focused on the passage of Comlex, as that is the exam osteopathic medical students must pass to graduate and to get osteopathic licensure. USMLE is something students can choose to take. It is not something they have to take. We are the number one medical school in the state for preparing primary care physicians serving in disadvantages in rural populations in California. Our class of 2026, 89% of them were from California. Is that because we have a California preference? We do not. But over 80% of our applicants come from California. So I think you can all do the math. If more than 80% of your applicants are from a certain area, obviously more than 80% of the people you accept are likely to be from that area as well. And we do have the DOMPH program. It's the largest one in the profession. Um, and it's about 12% of every class. We've won a number of awards in teaching and education, the Innovative Teaching and Medicine Awards. We won in 2016 by several of our uh, osteopathic manipulative medicine faculty and an anatomy instructor. We won again on our clinical distinction program, advancing the EPAs. EPAs are the um, professional goals that you must reach when you're in a residency program. Innovation in the development of enduring educational materials by our by Dr. Tammy Hendricks, who is our current dean of the osteopathic medical school and an alum of our school. And we won one on something called the score report, which involves looking at our the osteopathic core competencies and assessing them within our educational system. We have basic sciences, the translational and public health studies. We've received grants for that, metabolic research center grants and community and public health grants. We have a, a focus of interest in metabolic research. We have a world renowned um, translational researcher and a, a physician named John Mark Schwartz, it's a PhD, and in, a, in an osteopathic physician, Dr. Jay Shubrook, who is a diabetologist. Both have spoken internationally on their metabolic research and diabetes. Um, Dr. Schubert actually started the, the a diabetes fellowship out of our university. There are now six diabetes fellowships for practicing physicians uh, in the country, and this is the only one on the West Coast. 
Um, this is an example of someone doing some uh, osteopathic manipulation, and we do research in, in osteopathic manipulation as well as other research products, as I mentioned. But some of the research products we've done are named here, the impact of osteo, I'll just read a few of them, the impact of osteopathic manipulative treatment on pediatric patients, the effects of OMTs, which is what we call osteopathic manipulative treatment on heart rate variability. Uh, there's a number of them. Students can get involved in presenting them. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time because this would take almost our whole time to do this PowerPoint. So I'm going to sort of skip through some of them. I love talking about our community service and commitments. We have a student-run free clinic that is interprofessional. So not only do the osteopathic medical students work there, the PA students, the nursing students, and the College of Pharmacy students all participate in our student-run free clinic. We have a mobile diabetes education center that we call MOBEC, and they go out in the community and do diabetes education, diabetes screening, and they do vaccines. And as you can imagine, we're very, very busy during COVID. We have a diabetes prevention program. Students who attend our school can actually become certified in the NIH program on, <clears throat> excuse me, on diabetes prevention and where you get a certificate. And during the time that you're a student, we'll team up with another student who completed the program and actually have your own cohort of patients who are pre-diabetic. And uh, it's, a, it's a big commitment. It's weekly, I believe, for 16 weeks and then monthly after that for a year where you can work with those patients and help them hopefully prevent themselves from becoming diabetic. We also have Project Happy, which is where students are, are trained and then assigned to elementary school children where they actually work directly with the children. Parents are encouraged to join in, of course. They sometimes bring their friends and they're taught about exercise and, and food to help them stay healthy. Toro Cares um, probably started during the COVID area. Um, for doing first COVID testing and then COVID vaccines, but uh, it's our mobile vaccine vaccination program. They go out this year, they went out and did flu vaccines. They always have um, the Tdap or the tetanus diphtheria vaccine available. And um, when we can, now that the COVID vaccine is not free from the government for everyone, we can only get certain amounts, but we do what we can with helping our community. We're paired up with, but we paired with Kaiser. Uh, we've paired with, uh, with the Solano County. So it's a very active program. Talk a minute about our preclinical curriculum. We do something called integrated systems, which is a systems-based foundational, foundational basic science curriculum. Osteopathic doctoring, which is the course I used to teach and run. Um, history taking, physical examination, procedural, such as ultrasound, medical documentation, communication curriculum, and professionalism and ethics all fall under osteopathic doctoring. And then our osteopathic manipulative medicine, where students are trained in both the manual aspects of osteopathic diagnosis, prevention, and treatment, as well as the philosophies and practices of osteopathic medicine. It's a very robust curriculum that has all of the items I showed you on the last slide, We, in, in addition to everything that you see here. And it's all with a focus on our mission. One of the things we're particularly proud of is our WARM program, WARM stands for Wellness, Academic Achievement, Resilience, and Mindfulness. Uh, it is part of our mentoring program. Every student who enters gets is assigned a mentor and they meet at least once a semester or more often as needed. In addition, warm hosts in the College of Osteopathic Medicine specifically, six sessions each semester for two hours where both first and second year students in the preclinical years are scheduled off at the same time. None of this is required, but student-led events are held and supported by the institution to allow interaction between the classes and to allow some relaxation time. Some of that we have badminton, um, there's been volleyball, basketball. We, not too long ago, did a dumpling clinic, which was really fun. This, we had over 50 students show up to make dumplings, and they were really excited about it. And so WARM plays a big role in our curriculum, as well as in our philosophies on how we work with our students. Okay. You can just see students doing it. We have a sim lab. You can see some students working in the sim lab. 
You can see students who are on clinical rotations. And of course, this area is beautiful, but you all know that you're not, that, many of you are not that far away. There are 48 weeks required in the third year. And it's a combination of all of these topics. And you can certainly read them since we'll be able to share this PowerPoint. Uh, they consist of IM, FM, surgery, IM being internal medicine, FM being family medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, OBGYN, electives, and what we call clinical distinction. When the national boards went to a pass-fail, and both Comlex and USMLE did that, we wanted to make sure our students had a way to distinguish themselves at their residency interviews. So there are two four-week blocks. They can be done as a longitudinal event or two separate times where students can actually create their own curriculum for four weeks and then use that to distinguish themselves at their residency interviews. And we have seen some amazing clinical distinction products out of our students. So this just will tell you a little bit more about that. I'm not going to read through it because again, you'll have this and I don't want to spend our whole time showing you a PowerPoint. I want you to be able to ask questions. Our fourth year is also is 40 weeks and in the fourth year, instead of having core locations that you must go do your rotations at, we give you core topics, and you see what they are, and you set up your own rotations. We have lots of people to help you and lots of people to give you advice, and we have many relationships that you can um, work with. However, many students want to go where they want to go. You have a family member in Honolulu, and you want to do a surgery rotation in Honolulu, we make sure we have an affiliation agreement. We work with you to get that set up. We make sure the physicians are credentialed and you're able to go do an audition rotation out there. And I pick Honolulu because I love talking about one of my mentees from a number of years ago who wanted to be a surgeon. And he actually did go to the, to the University of Hawaii in Honolulu for his audition rotation, was interviewed. Um, he loved telling the story. And I don't know how many of you may or may not remember this, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Davis remembers and about four or five years ago, might be five now, there was a scare in Hawaii when somebody pushed the buttons to alert the islands that there could be incoming missiles and it sort of freaked everybody out and everybody had to go to their basements and the islands sort of shut down for a while. Well, he was interviewing that day. How'd you like to have your residency interview in the basement of the hospital with every other employee uh, in order to try and keep people safe? Uh, and it still turned out that that's where he matched. And he has just completed his first five years of surgical residency at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu and is now doing a fellowship um, in Oregon. So anything is possible with if you want to make it work. And you can see how that's set up. We also have a telemedicine uh, session and we have something called callbacks. We come back to campus for a week and you do OSCEs and you do... Um, OMM assessments. And so it's a chance to bring the class back together before graduation. So we have multiple services for osteopathic manipulation and they're multidisciplinary. There's primary care services, Solano counties and our F the FQHEs, which are federally qualified health centers, our own medical group, which is located in Stockton which right now currently focuses on inter internal medicine, neurology, urology, and psychiatric services. They hope to grow that. We have an OMT service at multiple locations um, at our local FQHCs, as well as in our own on our own campus. It's called the Learning Center. So we call it the OMMTLC and the Student Run Free Clinic. Um, and then we also have all of our diabetes care programs with our local partners, the mobile unit, et cetera. So... What I'll do one more set part is what differentiates us from other schools. We are definitely learner centered. We have an emphasis on social justice. We we follow the the competencies produced by the the American Osteopathic Association. There are seven competencies that they produced. It is osteopathic manipulative medicine, medical knowledge, patient care, interpersonal communication and skills professionalism, practice-based learning and improvement, and system-based practice. And we recently added an eighth program learning outcome of structural competency. So we have eight competencies that students are assessed on. We focus on humanism and education. Our clinical service lines are there to help our students advance. 
our we have an integrated residency development program and most osteopathic schools do not have their own hospital. We do not have our own on site in Vallejo, but we have a direct affiliation with St. Joseph's Hospital in Stockton. If you went, if you've ever been to St. Joseph's Hospital in Stockton, you'll actually see our logo and our sign on their building as well. They are a part, an integral part of the Toro University of California family. We have lots of personal and professional development opportunities in global health, research, community service, leadership, public health. And we recently had our since COVID, our first group of students this past year traveled overseas again. I'm going to close this down and let Mr. Davis do his presentation, and then we can um, take questions. So, uh, Dr. Widener, we have received a few questions in the okay. Q&A section. I think we'll we'll try and tackle some of those now. Okay, uh, perfect. Question, how does your school encourage interdisciplinary collaboration between students with different academic backgrounds to foster a well-rounded education and research experience? Uh, we are very open to students. Students are a part of everything at our school. Um, with regards to research, I know it'll sound strange because from if you're at a big institution and it doesn't quite work this way, but at our school, because we think of ourselves as a family, if you wanted to, if you heard that and there's lists of, of the research we do. You heard Mr. Davis was doing a research project in X. You'd literally go knock on his door or send him an email and set up an appointment and say, hey, Mr. Davis, I'm interested in that research project. Can you tell me more about it? Are you taking students? Do you have room for one more? Um, it, it really works that way. We do a number of projects with our partners in the nursing school, in the PA school, and in the pharmacy school. But it really depends on whatever a student wants to do. And if a student has a research project idea and can get a faculty to, to work with them, we can create a new one. And it often happens that way. Um, there is a diversity of backgrounds. One of the things we're focused on is team-based learning and active learning events in general. And when you start school at Toro, you will be placed in a team-based learning team. Um, those students, there's usually five or six in a team, will travel together in the first two years. They will be in their classes together. They will be in their labs together. They even, we do team-based exams. So you can, if you can imagine a major exam, you would do your individual portion. That's worth about 80 to 85% of your grade. And then you would immediately after that, take the exam again in your team where you get to teach each other, which helps you learn better again. And that's worth 10 to 15% of your grade as much as 20, I think, sometimes. And then after that's a short discussion for the whole group to talk about everything. So we really focus on uh, student learning. We have, a we have a very diverse way of, of teaching. We have directed studies or self-studies for those who learn better um, on their own. We record all of our straightforward lectures. We have a multitude of, of active learning events and hands-on labs. Those are usually mandatory and you have to be on campus for those. Uh, we also have a number of resources in our library. Uh, we have counselors, patient learning, uh, student learning specialists, and every student has a mentor and the opportunity to have a, a big sib, little sib with the class ahead of them. So the chances to be interdisciplinary and interprofessional are huge. We have at least one interprofessional event a year, sometimes two. Um, that works with all the other colleges. So as well as our diabetes module, which is taught between all of the colleges on the campus. Um, for a full week, the students have diabetes education in their second year and it's completely interprofessional. So it really depends on what you're looking for and how you wanna access it. Okay, the next question was, if a medical student chooses to not take USMLE Step 1, what does that mean for them? I'll take a stab on this, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Wagner. Um, for osteopathic medical students, USMLE is not required. The required exam is the COMLEX Level 1, 2, and 3. Um, so it is entirely possible for you to attend medical school, uh, take all three steps of the, uh, or all three levels of the COMLEX, and get a uh, position uh, without taking the uh, USMLE. Now, while the COMLEX scores are generally accepted at almost every residency, uh, there are going to be some of those more competitive ones that really would like to see USMLE scores to compare you to 
um, allopathic or MD students who are applying for the same residency. So if you are looking at uh, going for those ultra competitive residencies, you're probably looking at taking both the Comlex and the USMLE. And I'll add to that, Mr. Davis. So the ACGME, which is the group that certifies all the residency program, came out a few years ago after the single accreditation system was developed for MDs and DOs and said in print and as policy that there is no difference between the Comlex and the USMLE and that no residency program should play favorites or put a preference or demand that a student take USMLE. If you, you've all experienced a little bit of life and you understand that culture changes a little slower than policy. And so the culture is changing every day and we see it changing every day. Um, to Mr. Davis's point, if you're going into primary care, there is zero reason to take both exams. If you're even, even most general surgeries, orthopedics, the more common specialties, OBGYN, if you want to be a neurosurgeon and, the, and your number one choice is someplace in Ohio that has never taken a DO, you probably should take both exams and that's the kind of counseling you will get. Over time, I expect fewer and fewer students will take the USMLE. We had fewer take it this year um, and it's going to continue to go down. In addition, there is federal legislation that is sponsored by multiple legislators at the federal level called the FAIR Act, F-A-I-R, which is actually going, if, if passed, and we all believe strongly it will be, will make it in, against the law for a residency program to insist that a student take the USMLE. And since all of the residency programs get their funding from the Medicare services and the Medicaid services, which are our government services, clearly that would be a big issue for them if they did that. Uh, again, you have to get caught. So, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to change everything overnight, but I think it's going to make a significant difference. Okay. Next question. How can you stand out when applying to Toro when you're from out of state? Well, uh, first off, we don't have any preference for in-state or out-of-state. Uh, we're not obligated to take a certain number of in-state uh, applicants. And uh, something that we started, uh, we started implementing last year, we, we implemented a little bit more this year, our interviewers don't see your academics. Um, they don't see your GPA. They don't see your MCAT score. They don't see your list of courses because we want them to look at uh, those things that, that make you, you, that kind of fit with our mission, that tell us what your personality is, what kind of doctor you might be. Um, so you, you do, I, I, I preface, I, I give that preface to say that you do have to have solid academics because my office sees them. And we use those to determine who is actually going to interview, who qualifies for a supplemental. We have minimum requirements posted on our website. But in terms of the, the other things, so uh, take a look at your volunteer experiences. What have you been doing? What, what experiences do you have that show that there's more to you than just you, uh, that uh, you can think of others? Um, what medical-related experiences do you have? Um, have you been able to volunteer at hospitals or work in hospitals, uh, shadow doctors, work with doctors, work in a medical setting, uh, work or volunteer in a, uh, a community service type setting, like a soup kitchen or a, a food bank or something like that? Um, those are the things we're going to be looking at. So in general, that's how anyone stands out. What are those, uh, for lack of a better term, what are those plus ones in the application that uh, help us know or at least believe that that you're going to be a good person as well as a good physician. I'll tackle so, so, so that. Mr. I'll, Davis, tackle, I'll, I'll tackle, I'll tackle that answer that Mr. Davis asked that question. And then we'll see if they'll have more questions. Juven. Um, do your homework. You're applying to an osteopathic medical school. Read about it. Know about it. Know who Toro is. Read about it. Look at our website. Practice good interview skills. Read about what makes a solid interview. We interview online. Um, having people who are looking at their phone or looking up in the air or the light pops on on their screen and they're clearly eyes tracking, reading an answer. Guess you weren't really interested to prepare enough to be here. I know you're nervous, but you want to be prepared. But one of the biggest things is be aware of what an osteopathic physician is. 
Is it helpful to have a DO letter? It is, it's not required. Um, is it helpful to make sure that your application has no spelling errors and that you talk about being a DO and not just sort of the Wikipedia definition, but some of the things I touched on and some other things you may read about, look up Dr. Andrew Taylor still. Be prepared just like you've been prepared for all of your years of pre-med to get the averages that you've had, to be ready to apply to medical school, show your level of interest. I think those are the things that make a difference. Didn't mean to cut you off, Jubin. Oh, no, uh, I just was going to ask, um, what's the secret sauce, the secret ingredient, the the it factor, I guess you could say, because, you know, everybody's looking for that. I wish there was um, one. There were, there's no one thing. I, I, yeah. The, I, the, there's no one thing. I, I think that I, I, I just have to laugh because I, I, I literally just came off of a panel <laughs> where I kind of addressed this question. And... You know, to, to sum up, um, our interviewers are looking for people they would want to treat their mothers, not their mm -hmm. mother-in-law. Um, so we're looking at people who can be kind, who can be compassionate, who can understand that uh, the, the world does not evolve, does not revolve around them. That can be difficult for physicians, especially those in, in the highly stressful uh, uh, specialties, because in, in many ways, it does seem like the world revolves around them, but it doesn't. They're dealing with people. And we're looking for, we're looking for humans that can be around other humans and provide care. Now, that's easily, you know, easily said, right? But um, we're also looking for, for you know, people who know what they're doing. So you have to have those solid academics to uh, to get in um, again be um, be human be able to be be able to communicate be able to uh, look people in the eye when you're talking to them um, be able to be interested in what they're saying we have people that come in for interviews uh, or um, <laughs> from years ago now now they log in for interviews their interviews are done via zoom but um, they don't pay attention to the interview they're staring off, looking out of the window, or they're um, worse. They're they're typing. I literally had somebody uh, in a group we reviewed recently who was uh, denied because they were they were typing on their computer during the interview when people were asking questions. Um, and you know that's one of the things we can see that your your screen is going to show a flash of a different thing happening. Um, so. Be involved, be attentive, be human. And be a good fit to mission. Look at that mission statement and then be able to tell us why you fit. What is it about you that fits? Other little helpful hints I give people. And if you've already submitted your application, please do not go into a, into a panic. But I would tell you this. Everyone has a tendency to write a personal statement that talks about their sick or dying loved one. Well, everyone has a sick or dying loved one. That is not why you choose to be a physician and dedicate your life to service like this. There's something else. There was some piece of that, whether that be access to care in the system, whether it be you had to be a translator as a six-year-old child. There's more to it than just my brother got sick, my mother got sick or whatever. There has to be, because if you're only doing it for that one little reason, you'll be an unhappy physician soon enough. And so think about what else, because believe me, as somebody who reads lots of personal statements, and Mr. Davis does as well, after a while, I could write all of your personal statements, or I could just write my own, which would also fit. Um, so think about the other things that we can learn from you in your personal statement, not just about this crisis or tragedy that happened in your life. We're certainly sorry that everybody has had a tragedy, but that's the whole point everybody has. That's not dictating why you're choosing this career in this profession. Well, we'll get to the other questions in the Q&A after I talk about admissions a bit, but I do want to talk a little bit about the, yeah. the personal statement. The biggest thing about a personal statement is that it's personal. Now, we don't mean that you're sharing all of your deep, dark secrets or you know, oversharing stuff. But we want to know about you. What is your, what was your path 
to choosing to apply to medical school. You know, I don't want to say calling. I don't, <clears throat> I'm not going to pretend that everybody has a calling to go into medicine, but everybody should have a desire and that desire should not focus on the pay. There should be something else there. That said, if you started writing your personal statement and it leads off with, it was a dark and stormy night, stop. It's not a creative writing assignment, okay? You don't have to be that creative. Tell us what's going on. There is a prompt, so make sure you're answering the prompt, but work in there. <clears throat> Again, what are the reasons you have decided to apply to medical school generally? This is for the, the, the ECOMAS application. And then you can ask similar questions for the secondary application, but at that point, it's what are those specific reasons you want to come to Toro? So do keep that in mind when you're looking at those things. So give me a moment. Again, we'll go through, uh, we'll answer the other questions uh, after I get done here, but I did want to take a moment to talk about the admissions process. Um, I do apologize for my camera angle. Uh, I chose to uh, use my iPad today to log in and I'm at a different location and I didn't realize that um, it didn't take into account that the iPad's a little bit smaller than my laptop and the camera doesn't come in at the right angle. So I don't mean to be looking down my nose at you, but that's just a mad <laughs> a feature of the, of the camera angle. Um, the application process for medical schools, whether MD or DO, are remarkably similar. Um, both start off with a what is referred to as a primary application. So for MD schools, that's through the uh, AMCAS uh, application service. For DO schools, that's through a COMAS. Um, when you apply, you're going to have to answer some uh, essay questions. You're going to have to put in a lot of information, all your coursework and such, and they're going to spit out uh, for us to use uh, calculations of your GPAs. For our program, we do require a minimum. We do require minimum uh, cumulative and science GPAs of 3.0 or better, uh, and a minimum MCAT score of 500 or better uh, to qualify for a supplemental application. So, in sporting terms, that's that's the cheap seat ticket right? Uh, that gets you into the stadium. Now, to get closer to the playing field, those numbers need to be higher. Typically, and it's certainly not always, but typically those candidates that we're interviewing have GPAs 3.4, 3.45 or above, and they have MCAT scores 506, 507 or above. I say typically because we have a process in place where we have certain faculty members that do review uh, applications uh, to take a look to see if uh, if there's somebody that is beneath what we typically use for our interview benchmarks who should be brought in because they, they definitely fit our mission and there's something compelling about their story. And last year, that process resulted in about, I want to say 30 or 40 additional candidates being interviewed and a large number of those applicants were accepted ultimately following the interview. So um, it's our, you know, I, I hear a lot about a holistic approach to application review and how can you, how can you set minimums uh, and, and still be holistic? Well, you know, I've had conversations with colleagues who, who have those types of, of requirements or better yet, they have on their website, we don't have minimum requirements. We, we accept, we, we consider everybody. And I feel like in many cases, that statement needs to be changed to everybody deserves the opportunity to send us a supplemental application fee because certainly not everybody is considered equally uh, at that point. Um, for most schools, there's a holistic review process after you holistically meet minimum requirements. Um, we set our minimum requirements at a point where the percentage of failure increases too steeply for us to justify bringing somebody in. Remember, our goal is not just to admit somebody into the medical school, but to get them graduated, to get them out in the field. If we don't, if we don't set requirements that, that uh, are realistic, then the, the chance increases that somebody just comes in, they spend a semester or two or three, they end up having to drop out because they can't complete it or they fail out, and they end up being $100,000, $150,000 in debt with nothing to show for it. So we do have minimum requirements. We do strictly enforce them. If you are beneath our minimum requirements, we cannot consider your application. We have other pathways that can get you there. So if that's uh, where you're at, please uh, reach out to our office and we can kind of help you with that. Um, assuming you meet the minimum requirements and you're on track, uh, just let me back up a little bit. Coursework requirements, again, 
these are fairly standard amongst medical schools. Um, there may be some differences in flavor, but uh, pretty much all medical schools are gonna include uh, requirements for eight semester units each of biology, uh, general chemistry, organic chemistry, and physics. Um, those are our main required courses. Um, we recommend uh, certainly say a, um, or a anatomy course or something, but that's not required. Um, a specific degree is not required. I will say that those with hard science degrees typically have a bit of an advantage because their curriculum tends to be very heavily focused on the sciences. If you are a liberal arts major or some other major, um, you're gonna be taking a few more courses that likely are not part of your major. So your numbers will be limited. You wanna make sure you do especially well in those courses. So we get your application. Your, uh, your primary application from the application agency, we determine that you meet our minimum benchmark requirements. Um, and then we send you a supplemental application or secondary application. The terminology are, um, the terminologies are, are interchangeable. Um, it just means that we like what you said generally about applying to medical school. Now we want to get into the nuts and bolts. Um, this, you know, the supplemental application is, is for you to really tell us what you know about us, what you know about osteopathic medicine, what, what you know about how you want to practice as a, as a physician. Um, our, our supplemental application as a question about your exposure to osteopathic medicine. This will sound strange when I say this. Toro focuses on osteopathic medicine. Now you think that would be a straightforward thing for a college of osteopathic medicine to say, but in, in real terms, <laughs> for many, uh, for, for some colleges of osteopathic medicine, it seems like there's the medical school curriculum in one box and there's the OMM or osteopathic focus curriculum in another box. And you proceed in your medical education with those boxes side by side, but never the twain shall meet. They don't interact with each other. Here at Toro, you will learn osteopathic medical principles starting in day one, and you will learn them in every single class that you attend. Now, some are specifically focused on OMM, and you'll go in quite deep, quite a bit of detail, but throughout your education, you're going to learn about osteopathic medicine and OMM uh, practices. We want you to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that we force you into an OMM specialty or an osteopathic specialty. It doesn't mean that you can't come here and be a psychologist or I mean, excuse me, a psychiatrist or um, a sports medicine person or something like that. But we are a primary care focused uh, college. About 55, 60% of our students go into primary care. That does mean that about 40 or 45% of our students go into other specialties. So, you know, you're not locked out of certain specialties, but we wanna make sure you know up front, we are focused on osteopathic medicine. It is something we, we truly believe in. Um, we're unapologetic, unapologetic about it. If that's not your thing, I think I don't, wanna, I don't wanna do that. I think it's a waste of my time. There are literally a couple hundred other medical schools in the country you could consider. And we won't, we won't hold a grudge. So that's the supplemental application process. When we get that from you, we determine your letters of recommendation have come in. Instantly, we require two letters of recommendation, um, or well, let me rephrase that. We require either a letter of recommendation from your pre-health uh, committee, or we require two science letters from professors who have taught you in biological or um, physical sciences. Um, that's important. I have, to have taught you in a grade. It can't be somebody who is a research mentor who didn't give you a grade. And uh, you know, while you may have other letters you want to submit, <coughs> again, they must be from biological or physical sciences professors. Um, we don't require a uh, letter of recommendation from a physician. This is something that we changed um, during the pandemic years when it just was impossible for people to get out and, and meet with a physician. And then when we considered re-adding re it, we had a lot of discussion about that. Um, and the bottom line was we just didn't think that those letters were providing a, a critical piece to the admissions process because it was rare for somebody to be able to get a letter from a physician who actually knew them well. You know, a lot of people were treating that as a minimum requirement. They would go have coffee with a DO and then, and then have that DO write a letter. It was literally three sentences of why that person was nice over coffee uh, back in December. So can I, can I add something in there for me, Stephen? You bet. One thing to think about when you ask somebody for a letter, anybody, make sure they know you and ask them that question. Are you able to write me a letter that talks about how well you know me and why I'm a good candidate. 
I call them vanilla letters. You can call them whatever you want. We've all seen those letters. They're about a paragraph, maybe a paragraph and a half long. And they basically say, Stephen Davis is a great guy. When he was in the office, the staff really liked him. The patients thought he was charming. And he showed up on time and stayed all day and asked good questions. Do you feel strongly that you want Stephen? Every letter says that. But if they told me about the patient that he helped out to their car because they were weak and, and, and they named things that he did, now I feel like that doctor is really invested in writing that letter. Vanilla letters aren't helpful. And so if you know a physician and you can get somebody to write you one, we look at that. But I would rather you didn't have one if all you can get is something. <clears throat> yes. So, so the now one we thing, have all your, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do it. The, the one thing I would just add is uh, the shadow of uh, a DO thing. You could find like DOs that are in your community. I know someone who actually did the shadowing for a day and ended up getting a job during their post back year working for that DO. Uh, so I ended up working for them for a little bit over a year. And uh, she said that was probably her strongest letter of recommendation because she worked with this person for a year and, um, you know, really advocated for that person. And that also that DO went to a certain school which I will not name, but really advocated for her to go to that school. So, you know, it's a free thing you could do. It's a website. You put your zip code, you find like 20 DOs that volunteered their information to go out there. And so definitely take advantage of that. Uh, and also if you don't know what osteopathic medicine is, because there are DOs that do practice OMM and there are DOs that don't practice OMM. So I think it's a pretty good, um, um, a pretty good um, um, opportunity you could have. Oh yeah, there's there's the uh, California one too. Um, I'll pull that one up too. I forgot. Sorry. Yeah, I would I would also ask. We've we've heard the, the word shadow mentioned a couple of times, and I want to I want to point out there are there are differences here. So shadowing a deal, S H A D O W I N G. Um, is an, uh, a service offered uh, by the AOA and by various other uh, professional associations that will put you into contact with a uh, a doctor of osteopathic medicine to um, to uh, accompany that person at their practice um, to learn what they do. We also have a program. It sounds the same. It's called Shadow, but it's actually S H D S H A and then yeah. capital D O which is, um, that is a, uh, a program offered, thank you, thank you, Dr. Brady. Uh, it's a program offered by our students. Uh, it, it's entirely student run. Uh, they arrange to have you come in and either um, sit with them through a lecture uh, for a morning, uh, attend a lab, uh, do, do some things with them during the day as students to give you that opportunity to see what they do, see what medical school is like. Unfortunately, again, I don't have that link with me, but if you are interested in, uh, in that information, you can email us uh, at uh, tuc.admit at toro.edu, and I can make sure to put you in the contact. I'll see if I can't find it. it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so we now ha have all your stuff. We're now looking at your application materials to determine who we're going to bring in for an interview. I won't tell you an exact bar. I've alluded to it in terms of the academics, but we're, really, we're looking for people who are going to be a good fit, who are, are, are going to do well in our program. Um, I will say that our class size is increasing this year. Um, for over 10 years, we held at 135 students in the class. Um, this year, we are increasing our class size to 189 students. <coughs> what that means is we're interviewing more people. We're accepting more people. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, we're waitlisting more people. Um, that's the way that works. But... Uh, the, the ratio of being uh, interviewed to being accepted is generally pretty high. Um, we, in terms of application numbers, we get anywhere between 4,500 and 5,500 applications each year uh, from the application agency. We'll, um, we'll interview this year. I think we're planning on interviewing about somewhere between seven and 800 applicants uh, for a class size of 189 seats. Um, uh, Understanding that that uh, some people we accept will not accept our offer because they uh, they went through the interview and they chose not to, 
Um, others will be accepted will deposit into the class and then withdraw because they get accepted to a school that's uh, higher on their list. But that's why those numbers are the way they are. But you can see that, you know, uh, uh, being having a chance of acceptance as a pool of seven, 800 that are interviewed is much better than having than you know, the, the pool of 4,500 to 5,500 applicants. So uh, do keep that in mind. Um, the interview itself is a Zoom interview. Um, it's an hour. The, the interview day starts at 9 a.m. and runs until 2 p.m. And it includes a lot of different presentations uh, and other information that is given to you. The actual interview itself is an hour and 15 minutes. It is a panel style group interview, meaning that you are in the same Zoom room with uh, up to four other applicants and three uh, representatives from Toro. Uh, in almost all cases, it'll be one, um, one clinical sciences person, one physician uh, and DODO, one basic sciences uh, faculty person, and then a current uh, second or first year student. All of our faculty uh, provide their recommendations and all get a, uh, and uh, they, those recommendations following the interview. Then, uh, get reviewed by the admissions committee. Uh, we do have a student rep on the committee, so he's he or she is representing the student vote. Um, and uh, at that point, they take into account your entire application and decide uh, if they want to recommend you for acceptance or waitlist or denial. And then the dean uh, is the final arbiter of, of that uh, process, and she decides whether to follow the committee recommendation, which she does, I'm going to say, 99 point eight percent of the time or if there's some compelling reason why she believes somebody should have a different uh, decision uh, she makes that determination so that is the admissions process um, in a nutshell and with the requirements so i'm going to return to the q a and see what yeah, questions. there is a chat question um could you talk a little bit about how the application timeline differs from that of allopathic schools or mainly about the timeline if not comparing to md <clears throat> so you know, I'm not sure that it really differs a lot. Um, it just depends on what your preference is. You know, um, the the MD process, just by sheer number, is 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 more competitive than it is for DO schools, where the average DO school probably gets somewhere between somewhere around 3,000, 3,500 applications a year. Uh, the average MD school is probably going to be getting somewhere between 55 and 6,500 applications each year. And the class sizes aren't remarkably different uh, between MD and DO schools. So um, what that results in is uh, if you're applying to MD programs, you're really trying to get those applications in uh, probably by October 1st at the latest for the best chances at, at MD schools. That date can change a little bit for DO schools, although I'd say that, um, again, um, we tend to be quite competitive as well. Maybe not as competitive as, the, as some MD schools, but you know, the, the general rule of thumb for applying to medical school is if you have everything together and you, are your, you believe you are at your most competitive, submit that application by October 1st for the best chances. If there are things in your background that you feel like you have to address, you're missing coursework, you've got lower grades than you want, you don't have as many experiences, delay your application. Address those things first. One of the biggest mistakes I see from applicants to, to, to our program and from speaking it to colleagues, they see it at their schools as well, is apply when you're not ready. Uh, I am, I'm going to submit my application in October, but I'm not taking my MCAT in until December and I haven't really been studying for the MCAT or worse, I've been studying for the MCAT, I've taken practice tests, but my scores aren't where they should be. I will, let me be the first to tell you, if your practice exam scores aren't where you want them to be, there's virtually no chance in hell that your, your official score is going to be where you want it to be. So you need to figure out what to look at, what to do, so that you can do well on, on the MCAT. Um, if a master's program is something that you need to do or, or taking additional coursework at community college is something you need to do, do it. Don't waste the time and money on applying to medical schools to, just because you might have a chance if you know there are things that are missing. Um, 
take advantage of advisors, meet with them, talk to them, take advantage of, of opportunities to go to the schools you're interested in and, and see what they're offering. Uh, we have weekly, what we refer to as Toro Talks Q&A sessions. Every, you know, most Fridays, discounting holidays and, and days that we have to cancel, <clears throat> from 12 to 1 on Zoom. The information is in the event section of our website. Um, we offer a drop-in Zoom session. Anybody can drop in and ask questions about the program. Uh, much of, uh, most of the time, Dr. Wagner is there. I've got my staff that are there. We sometimes we occasionally have other faculty members that are on, uh, stu students that, that log in. It is a great opportunity to learn more and ask your questions. And it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to re register. You just show up. I think I answered the question. Let me know if I did. I think you did. I'm not sure if they think you did, but I thought you did. <laughs> so I think that's, uh, I see you've answered quite a few questions in, in the Q&A while I was talking. Uh, what other questions do you have? This is, you know, we have what, another 35, 25 minutes or so. Uh, yes, Juba, you can drop in any time. <laughs> um, some of the questions people are asking, they're asking about numbers. And so, the data is posted on their website. I think they've done it for like three or four classes. So look at it and, and also know that if it's a mean average GPA um, and, and talk about average MCAT and, you know, talk about the, you know, I guess people want to know more about ranges. I think that's some of the questions okay. in there. So averages are just that. They're averages. There are people above and there are people below that affect that average. Um I think in terms of GPA, um, uh, we've we've accepted people with GPAs in the in the very low threes, um, and we've accepted people with MCATs, uh, not counting our master's students because that's a different different ball game. But we've accepted people with a uh, at least a couple with a 500, 501. But understand, you know, we're the the ranges don't. I put this the ranges don't mean as much currently as they used to again our interviewers cannot see <coughs> your gpa remcat or your coursework they, they cannot see your your course by course grades um, that was a deliberate effort on our part because we we wanted to remove the potential bias those things suggest it is very difficult i don't care who you are if you've got one seat available, you've got two applicants, one's got a 525 on the MCAT and a 395 or 4.0 GPA. The other's got a 3.05 GPA and a 501 on the MCAT. I don't care who you are. You're, you can't help but be influenced by those numbers. Um, and we, our, our attempt was to try and make sure to the, to the extent possible that we removed that, that bias. We've asked our interviewers to start looking at you know, the applications in a deeper way. Look at the way the questions are answered. Look at the background of the, uh, of the applicant. Um, consider what they know about, what they say they know about osteopathic medicine. Really read the personal statement. What is their life's journey? Um, in short, looking for applicants who who really do meet the mission that uh, for for Toro. Um, so you know, again, if I were advising you, try to get those your averages where as close to where we where we post. Um, but uh, it's it's not it's not the end of the world if you fall a little short there. Is the minimum GPA requirement for just science or cumulative? The answer is yes. It's for both. So we do need it to be both. I, I have a question, and I know this is something that's come up. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your master's, your post back your master's in science and medical health sciences, and how sure. does that work? And also, like, how does that impact does it hurt you? Does it help you? Does it, you know, all that good stuff? Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, think of it as a one year long interview. You are 
taking, I mean, I, I, it's my favorite way of describing it because it really fits. For one year, you will take classes that are taught by medical school faculty. All the people who teach in the MSMHA's course are current comm faculty. You will, will do research with a member of the College of Osteopathic Medicine. And if you, it's 3.1, Stephen, or is it 3.0? If you get, if you maintain an average above, I believe 3.1, you will get a guaranteed interview. 3.0. Is it 3.0? 3.0 or 80% weighted. Yeah. You will get a guaranteed interview. Now, it then becomes your interview to win or not. And most of our master students do very well because they've spent time getting to know people. And the other thing, I'm going to echo something that Stephen will probably say, this is sort of that last opportunity to show that you can cut the academic chop, that you have the academic chops, that you can cut it. And you have to be able to do that. So um, at this point in time, as we sit here today speaking to you, there is no guaranteed acceptance with certain grades in the master's program. That is something that is under investigation for some consideration in the future. Don't know if or when that will happen. Yeah, I, I would add that, you know, um, life happens. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it, it is something that, you know, that, uh, that, that impact all of us, that we may not uh, have performed as well as we wanted to in our undergraduate uh, careers, um, you know, uh, for any number of reasons. Um, but I've said that we're really interested in people who are looking to align themselves with our mission. And our Master of Science in Medical Sciences program is, is one of those ways that we can facilitate that process. So. Um, the minimum requirements for that program are different than those from our medical school. Um, the MS MHS program requires a minimum GPA of 2.50 or better, both science and cumulative. And no MCAT is required to get into the master's program. Now, I'll have a caveat there on that in a moment, but just no MCAT score is required to get into the master's program. As Dr. Wagner mentioned, it is a one year, two semester program. And it does end up being a, a, a one-year interview because everybody that's teaching that program is faculty in the medical school and almost all of them interview with the medical school. So um, on top of that, the coursework that you complete in the master's program is some of the same coursework that you take in your first two years of medical school. Now, to be fair, it doesn't go into, it doesn't go as deep into those topics but it, is, it covers some of the same topics, a little bit shallower um, over, to, over the first two years of, your, of what would be your medical school curriculum in one year. It also has that research component. So um, if you get a 3.0 GPA or 80%, and it's because the program does a percentage basis, it's weird and the calculations are weird. So it's 3.0 or 80% or better in the master's program right now, you're guaranteed to back up for that. And you, you take and score at least a 490 on the MCAT. Um, if you come in with a 490 or better, you're set. If you take it after the program, you're set. Um, so 3.0 or better in the program, 490 or better on the MCAT, you are guaranteed an interview with the uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine in Vallejo and with the Torocom College of Osteopathic Medicine in um, Grand Falls, uh, Montana, Great Falls, Montana. So to my knowledge, I think we're one of the few master's programs in the country that has a guaranteed interview for two different medical schools. Um, as Dr. Wagner alluded to, um, the numbers look pretty good. On average, we take somewhere between 30 and 40 uh, master's students into our class each year. Um, again, and, and the class size, fluctuates in the master's program between say 60 and 80 students. Um, some won't finish the program. Some will finish and won't have done as well as they, they wanted to. You know, that's why I'm, I'm upfront for anybody who considers the master's program and tell them that you have to view this as your last, op your last chance opportunity. That you have to treat this as something you must do well in. 
And I'm not talking about necessarily flat Bs across the board. That shouldn't be your goal. That's the minimum. You want B plus averages um, at least when you're getting out of that program. Because you're, if you're entering the program because you're trying to address some perceived weakness in your academic record, then your academics in that program have to be strong. But it does what it's supposed to do. It gets a lot of people into medical school. Uh, we're happy with it. Um, and uh, so if you want more information about that, you can contact me. And I'll be happy to, uh, uh, to put you into contact with somebody. Or, um, again, we have a Toro Talks uh, Q&A session for the master's program uh, that is offered every Thursday from uh, 12 to 1. Okay. And that, again, that information is in our, uh, uh, on the events section of our website. Um, so that's uh, a couple the end of my, uh, yeah. The I'm only thing at that, them here. So Christian asked. Oh, I, oh no, the only thing that I would just add is ahead, that I know a couple of people that have gone through that program and did it well, really well, but is that what you've done in the last four or five years, that one year you should probably do very differently. That means like not, you know, putting too many things on your plate and being focused on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that there is, I know that, I don't know if there's the data there, but I know that a lot of people that have done well in that have gone to Toro. So if that's something you're interested in. Uh, it's not an official statement, but I'm just telling you that it's, it's a good shot. It's a good chance yeah. if you do well. There's, there's, there's other opportunities that uh, master's students, again, by and large, they're applying to the master's program because they want to get into medical school, um, our specifically. But there are students who end up going to other medical schools. Um, we do have agreements in place, uh, guaranteed interview for our uh, PA program, I think one or two, that's very limited. And then a guaranteed interview, I think, for our pharmacy program as well for students who, who attend the master's program. So there are opportunities there to uh, to take uh, to take advantage of, I I, I would mirror uh, Jubin's uh, um, uh, caution, uh, as, as he put it. Um, your focus while in the master's program is academics, and so your first semester in that program should almost be exclusively academics. Make sure that you're doing well. Do whatever you need to do. Don't have distractions. It's one of the reasons why the master's uh, program director. Um, strongly, we can't we can't prohibit you, but strongly discourages anybody from trying to prepare for and take the MCAT while attending the master's program. Uh, do some people do it anyway? Yes. Do people do well on the MCAT in spite of the, uh, of the effort or the, the stress of the master's program? Yes. Okay. Do some absolutely bomb the MCAT? Yes. And that's the problem. Again, remember, last chance. If you bomb the MCAT and worse, then you've maybe lost time studying for the master's program, so you do, don't do as well in there in that as well, you're kind of screwed. So, you know, we're, let us work with you. We'll, we'll figure it out with you. So questions in yeah, the... Yeah, doing the uh, same thing over and over again and, you know, it's it's. I think Einstein said it's a thing of, it's a definition insanity, of insanity. Insanity. And so um, I would just strongly suggest if you have low GPAs or had other things going on, like it, it happens to a lot of people. You have family issues, you have financial issues, you have heartbreak, you have loss, all these different things. Like focus that year. Don't try to do the masters and work and shadow and run a national organization and I don't know, try to do... Um, all of those yeah. different things. I, it's, it's, not, yeah. it's not the time to build your resume on your service. That's the year for you to be academic. Exactly. So two uh, two questions in, in the uh, Q&A section. Christian asks, what is unique about Toro's medical school culture and local community that can assist in adjusting to a new phase in a student's development? Uh, I think that's my job. This is my question. Um, there are so many things. Uh, I mentioned some of them earlier. We have student learning specialists. We have mental health counselors. Students have the part, the ability to participate in the big SIB, little SIB program. We do team-based learning and put you in small groups 
both for your TBL events and then slightly larger groups of like six to seven to eight people for our osteopathic doctoring labs and osteopathic uh, manipulative treatment labs. Um, every student is assigned a faculty mentor and they may change if they develop a bond with someone else. We have a strong open door policy that really is an open door policy. Um, and even during COVID when everybody was on Zoom, I think it was an open Zoom policy. I felt like I was on Zoom 24 seven some days because that's when students could meet. Um, the, the ability to be there for the students is it's that culture within the, within the college of osteopathic medicine, there are three committees that I know of that do not have student memberships. Every other one has voting student membership in the leadership boards. And the three that don't are pretty obvious. The Dean's leadership council doesn't. And I think you can assume, you know, does she meets with student leaders all the time, but they're not on her actual leadership council. Our student promotions committee, that's a FERPA issue. And then we call it the PASS team, preclinical academic strategy support team. And those are about grades. And we don't put students on those committees because we can't share grades with all of you. And we're finalizing our clinical or our class team, our clinical academic strategy support team um, is being finalized and it will be in place this semester still. So there is a lot available to help you settle in. Um, I've had mentees that work with me and I've met with them. And even from the current first year class, I have several who I've seen multiple times and it's January. And you might think, wow, that's a lot of seeing Dr. Wagner. Well, if they had questions, they saw me. And then I have some who made, who made it to their one mandatory meeting in the semester and they're flying high. They're doing good. They don't need to talk to me and I'm not going to make them come meet with me if they don't need to. So a lot of this is also some self-awareness and recognition when you need help, but help is always available if you ask for. Okay. Next question is, are you seeing the average age of students increasing in the last few years? Is it common for applicants to have a, a one or more gap years now? Um, I, you know, no, um, our average age for applicants always seems to hover between 25 and 27 years of age. I think one year we dropped to 24, um, but usually um, we, we have a good number of students who will who end up taking a gap year in college, uh, after college. I, I would say that, you know, if you're going to do that, uh, when you apply, we need to see what you've been doing for that year. If it's just I, in essence, sat on my butt and didn't do anything, uh, that's a problem. And if you spent that time traveling or you did, you did something significant, you know, we want to be able to see that in your application. Um, so uh, you know, keep in mind that gap years are, are fine, but there should be a plan behind why you're doing it. Uh, and we should be able to tell what that plan is. So I think that takes care of the questions that were in the Q&A uh, prompt. We have another, what, eight minutes, Jubin? Is there any anything you want us to, to address or any other questions that anybody might have? What's the meaning of life? No, I mean, look, I, 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 I personally want, don't have any questions. It won't do you any good. Yeah, I personally don't have any questions. I was going to say, but because I could, I could, you okay. know, I could get a hold of you if I have them. Um, the winning lotto ticket? I don't know. It's up. It's, it's <laughs> let me up say to the that, people um, that. <laughs> let, let me say that I, you know, I, I don't like plugging other universities' and events, but I think this one is important. Um, annually, UC Davis puts on their pre pre health pre public health um, uh, symposium or conference, whatever they're calling it. Um, it's it's now a one day event. Jubin is 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 very familiar with it because he is the reason that event started way back when we both had far less gray hair, and you know in his case a little bit more of it. Um, and it's just an excellent opportunity to to learn about different schools and a lot of different professions all in one area in one day. So uh, if you see those advertisements for that event, you'll probably want to try and go to that. Um, you won't be disappointed. We're going to be there. 
Um, other schools are going to be there. It's just a great resource for applicants to, to find information on one area. So, Yes. Mr. Davis goes, well, when, when he used to be two days, he used to curse at me because <laughs> at the end of Sunday, he was so exhausted and tired and, and he would curse at me. Um, never, <laughs> never. I thought I was the only one he cursed at. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I would say that um, just by uh, word of advice uh, for everybody, um, do keep in mind that um, there are resources out there for you. Um, choosing what, choosing whether to go to graduate school or, or professional school is a big is a big decision. Uh, choosing which graduate or professional school to go to is an even bigger decision. Um, so when you're looking at things, you're, I, what I usually tell people when they when they start the application process is first sit down and decide what is important for you, um, and and don't think about any particular school at that point. Just what things are important to you? Do you have to be by the water? Do you have to be in a big city or a little city? Um, Your family. Do you, yeah. Do, do, you, um, how, do you have to have, do you thrive in lectures or do you, are you purely a hands-on person? Are you somebody who never goes to class, reads something once and remembers every word? If you, so, as, if you do, as a side note, I hate you. Um, uh, that, that's important to know. Are, do you need a lot of attention? Do you need a lot of interaction with, with, with faculty? Um, are you looking for the cheapest school? Are you looking for the most expensive school? Um, uh, is reputation important to you? Are you looking for that ultra competitive residency that only one school in the nation has shown that they put somebody in the last 10 years? Um, all of those things and many more should be things you consider and make a list about. But then, and only then should you start looking at schools. Um, visit websites. If you can, go to those schools. Uh, drop in on, on, uh, on Prospective Students Day, on open houses. Um, attend virtual events. Talk to others who have gone to those schools. And make a list. Most people are applying to somewhere between 10 and 20 medical schools each year. Um, your list may, may vary because of, it's expensive, right? Um, you start saving. Uh, that's one of the reasons we, we chose to remain with virtual interviews is because we didn't want to saddle our, our applicants with the additional costs associated with interview travel. Um, so make your list and, and rank it. There's nothing wrong with ranking that list. So your list should look like, if you're gonna go with 10 schools, number one should be that pie in the sky uh, school. So if, if the sun, moon, and stars align just right, you could get in. That's, you know, that, that's good. Your bottom two should probably be those schools you believe you are overqualified for that aren't, aren't necessarily viewed as competitive and that you have a really good shot of getting into. Now, you'll notice I didn't say backup schools. There is no such thing as a backup school in the medical school, in the medical school application process. Let me underscore that. There is no such thing as a backup school. Every school is competitive in their own way. Every school is looking at different things. So pick those two schools you think you are well qualified for. Those are your bottom. The middle ones are wherever you want to go, ranked on according to your list. Now you're ready to start applying. You're ready to start interviewing. Constantly review your list. Constantly refer to it and decide, does this school still remain my number one choice? Or, you know, have the rankings changed? Sometimes you'll get accepted to that number one school and you'll be tempted to say, you know what, I'm going to stop interviewing because I've, got, I've been accepted to my number one school. Costs permitting, finances permitting, interview everywhere you get an opportunity to interview at and submit an application for any school that invites you to do so. Again, costs permitted. I say that because with all of your research, maybe you weren't able to visit or you weren't able to visit enough. Maybe you visited a school on a bad day. Maybe something had happened. But you go for the interview and you just fall in love with that school. There was a, Maybe there was a, a particularly strong student uh, interaction. And you just got that feel that, you know, I can see myself here. I feel comfortable here. 
And suddenly a school that was the bottom of your list goes right on up to the top, even though you've already been accepted to what you thought was your top, top choice school. So apply to uh, limit your applications to only those schools that you know you, that you can physically apply to. So if you can afford to apply to 20 schools, then apply to 20 schools. If you can afford to apply to, to 30 schools, you can do that. I think that'd be driving you crazy, but you could. But remember, your goal is to interview at every school that invites you to interview. So there's expenses there as well. I'm going to add one thing to this, and Mr. Davis is going to laugh. Please, whatever you do when you read things like studentdoctor.net, take those comments with the grain of salt that they're meant to be taken. Everybody posting on there are pre-med students who are, who are, it's like whisper down the lane. I'm going to tell you what I heard from so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so. And by the time you're hearing it, it is likely not true or only some part of it is. And you will hear things and see things that will cause you to get stressed out, will cause you to worry unnecessarily, and maybe cause you to think about not applying somewhere that you really wanted to apply to because you'll be convinced you don't have a shot. So understand all the people posting on there are not necessarily posting on there in, in anyone's best interest except their own. And that does not mean I don't think there's valuable things to be learned. I know that a lot of you get a lot of valuable information on there, as well as you get some peer support. It's like a support group, you know, on steroids. But just remember that the people posting on there are not usually at all from medical schools. And they don't, they're not commenting. And therefore, you're not always getting the right story. And I always feel bad, and I know Mr. Davis does as well, when we hear that. Well, it's said on studentdoctor.net, and it's like, oh, no, that has nothing to do with the price of tea in China. That is not true. I'm so sorry you've worried about that. So your your source for technical information about any particular school is going to be the admissions office from that school. Now, certainly, you didn't get opinions on student doctor, but remember what they say about opinions. Or um, assumptions. Or assumptions, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, just keep in mind that um, it can sometimes be a good idea to see to get a feel for people, but um, you know if you really want to know detailed information about a school, contact the admissions office. Our, our jobs are to be available to answer questions from you, um, put you into contact with students when we can. Uh, so you know do do keep that in mind. And we are with that. And I, I would even I would even I would even go as farther to say that um, don't hear opinions I've heard from my neighbors, dogs, friends, uncle, brother-in-law. Like, don't like, you know. And I, you know, there's you could get source. You know, you could get answers directly from the source. And also, like social media and those types of things. Like, people, you know, you could listen to people's opinions, views, and those types of things, but don't take it as a definitive because, again. It's. I don't know if anybody's ever done this game where you sit at a, at like ten people and then you say something one time in someone's ear, and by the time it gets to the tenth person, it's you know you say you know a blue hat crosses the street, and by the time it gets to the tenth person, is you know it's a red hat dancing on a building or something. It's so again, it's a uh, it's one of those things that you know people get really stressed out. So. And I would say also you can share that when I talked about how student-centered we are, I don't know a lot of medical schools that ha have what we have, and I know Mr. Davis appreciates this help. Um, I don't know how many students I talk to in a given year, but people send an email and say, I have questions, I'd like to talk to you, get your opinion on my application, and I send them uh, my Cleanly link and they can make themselves a 30-minute appointment and I talk about our school and I help them look at their application and think about the things they may need to tweak or, or how I can help them. Um, I have other people who can do it if I can't. And so it helps you to get an idea of who we are as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for letting us, uh, letting us speak Absolutely. with you today and uh, reach out with questions. Jubin, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for your time uh, coming on a Saturday and I'm sure you've had other events happening and, uh, thanks, everyone, for being here, and catch you on the next one.
Bye bye. Got it. Thanks, bye. everybody. Good seeing Thanks you. Bye.